So can I first of all outline uh, what I want to see arising from this motion, which I understand will not be opposed uh, by government, and I will get to that in a few moments. I want to see a resourcing of the national maternity strategy. I want to see modern, fit-for-purpose maternity hospitals with modern, fit-for-purpose maternity suites for women right across this state. I want to see it for all women, and I want to see investment in all of our maternity hospitals right across the state. The Minister will be aware that while I accept Hollis Street is not fit for purpose, and while some of the comments about the state of, of Hollis Street may have been exaggerated, I certainly would agree with the Minister that it is not a hospital that is fit for purpose and we do need a new national maternity hospital. But equally, the Rotunda Hospital has difficulties and challenges, as the Minister knows, and has for a long number of years been fighting for resources to increase capacity and to make it a, a better maternity hospital for the women who use that hospital. I can give many more examples of maternity hospitals across the state where we know buildings are antiquated, the services are not what they should be, and I think we all should commit to better resourcing uh, maternity services as we go forward. I also want to see a new national maternity hospital. I want to see it built by the state, I want to see it managed by the state, and I want to see it owned by the state, including the land. Why? Because I go back to what you said to me last week when I asked you this question, Minister. Uh, this has always been what I would prefer as public ownership and to own the freehold. That's what you said when I asked you that question last week. Your preference was for public ownership. You also said at the time, Minister, that you had uh, engaged in discussions with the St Vincent's Healthcare Group in relation to the ownership issue, uh, and that uh, that is something that you had put on the table. Unfortunately, Minister, that is not what was said to us at the Health Committee yesterday, and what was said to us uh, in the words of the Chair of the St Vincent's Healthcare Group, that there was no meaningful discussions over the course of the last five or six years on the ownership of the land issue. And it strikes me that while you say that was your stated objective, and while the Tornister says that was his stated objective, and while the Taoiseach states that was his stated objective, in reality the government raised the white flag on the ownership issue and just accepted what the St Vincent's Healthcare Group want, as opposed to standing up for taxpayers, standing up for citizens and getting the best outcome. Simply because St Vincent's Healthcare Group tell us what their best outcome is doesn't mean that's the end of the matter when it is, after all, the taxpayer that's footing the bill. And when it is, after all, the taxpayer minister that will also fund the day-to-day -day running of the hospital for decades and for generations to come. I genuinely believe, Minister, that the decision that was made today by Cabinet is the wrong decision. And I think it's the wrong decision because we have now signed up to a legal framework that is really complicated, complex, convoluted and, in my view, unnecessary. And it's all a product of the fact that we're proceeding to build, for the first time since Loan to Care, a hospital that will not be in full public ownership and that will be a hospital run by an independent charitable company as opposed to a HSE hospital. I don't believe, Minister, in the 21st century, it's beyond us as a people when we're building hospitals that we build hospitals that are publicly owned, publicly run, publicly managed in the interests of the public and of patients. That, for me, is a very, very clear policy objective that should be met. We also heard an awful lot of commentary over the last number of um, weeks and indeed months, if not years, that the Sisters of Charity uh, were not interested in or had not got a preference to gift the land to the state, despite at one point them saying that they wanted to gift the land to the people of Ireland. We know now what happened. The land was transferred to St Vincent's Healthcare Group. Uh, the Sisters of Charity, we are being told, have divested all of their interests in the land. I'm not disputing that. Uh, and the sole owner of the land is now the St Vincent's Healthcare Group. We had some very lengthy discussions Minister with the St Vincent's Healthcare Group Board at the Health Committee yesterday. All of the questions about ownership were put to them. We put very straight questions to them. Who owns the land? They said, we do. They said, we do. They said, we, they said the, oh, the land 
the landowner, the landlord, and you can go back and check the record because I was in the room, Minister, you were not. They said the landlord is St Vincent's Healthcare Group. When I asked them who owned the land, they said the St Vincent's Healthcare Group. They said there was a lease arrangement. They said they did not say the state. They said, in, in, with respect, if it's not questions and answers and over and back, I'd, I'd pref I, and I would give way to the Minister if that was allowed. But my point is, I had those discussions with them. I put very direct questions to them. And they were very, very clear that the landowners were St Vincent's Healthcare Group and that there was a lease arrangement in place between the HSE and St Vincent's Healthcare Group. And I put it to them very directly. Who owns the freehold? They said St Vincent's Healthcare Group, because that is a fact. No matter how many times the government tries to spin it, that is a fact and that is what they said. They also said that they were not going to give the land to the state. So if they're not telling us they're not going to give the land to the state, and they also said, and in fact, we had no meaningful discussions on that issue over the last while, then what's the issue then? If you're telling us that we own the land, and you're also telling us, and they're telling us that they won't gift us the land, it can't be both. The reality is that they are the landowners, they haven't gifted the land to the state, and if they did, we wouldn't need to establish the National Maternity Hospital at Ellen Park, that company, because we would be building a HSE hospital on public land. We would obviously have to have arrangements in place between the hospitals on the campus and, and the HSE hospital. There are different sorts of arrangements. We wouldn't need a company to be established that would then have directors coming from different sources. That would be completely unnecessary. That company would not need to be formed and then, of course, would not be a subsidiary of the St Vincent's Healthcare Group. None of that would happen. So you can't credibly come in and say there are no contractual issues, no legal issues. We own the land and yet a company has been established to run and manage the hospital with a lease arrangement with St Vincent's Healthcare Group and all of the complications and legal contractual issues with constitutions and licences and leases all in place for one reason and one reason only, because we don't own the land. And I said to you and I said to the Taoiseach uh, several times over the last number of weeks, what efforts are being made to persuade St Vincent's Healthcare Group to gift the land to the state? And it again transpires from yesterday, again from the words of the chair of the St Vincent's Healthcare Group, that there was absolutely no communication from head of government to Taoiseach with the St Vincent's Healthcare Group. I think that's just absolutely bizarre and in fact unbelievable given the importance of this. We're going to lock ourselves into a legal framework for generations to come. It was not the right decision. I'll finish on this, Minister. It's deeply cynical, by the way, not to oppose, to, not to oppose a motion, but at the same time having no intention of supporting it. Okay, if you're not going to oppose it, then vote against it. If you're going to support it, then implement it. And it seems to me that's not what you're going to do. Deputy Colnan, um, could you formally move the motion? I, I move the motion. Yeah, so, Deputy O'Reilly, two and a half minutes. Um, I would invite uh, Minister Butter, since she's here, to maybe correct the record in relation to what is and isn't a Nightingale Hospital. And I, I hope that she has uh, a Nightingale Ward, and I hope she's brought herself up to speed with that basic piece of information since our last debate. Um, Minister, you know what the concerns are. You've heard them. And, you know, I, I'm going to quote from a tweet and maybe given all the circumstances and the, the trouble on Twitter, I shouldn't mention it, but you look at, I'll go there anyway. Gav Riley said, uh, referencing yourself, Minister, it simply wouldn't be possible for circumstances to arise that a woman would be uh, denied an elective termination. If it were to arise, the Minister for Health could exercise his golden share. So the thing that can't happen might happen, and if it did, this is what would happen. So you see why there might be a little bit of ambiguity there and a little bit of concern just in that sentence. This thing is not going to happen. But if it does happen, the thing that's not going to happen, well, then I will step in. But you see, for far too long to access healthcare, women in Ireland have had to go to the courts. They've had to petition their politicians. They've had to get down on their hands and knees and beg or get onto their street feet on the streets and demand that health care. But what you're saying now is there is a form of health care which should be available to women, which you say will be available to women, but just in case it's not, well, then I, I'll do this other thing. So that's, you know, sentences like that do not help. When people say they are concerned, you can't dismiss them away by saying, actually, I have this in hand. It's not going to happen. But if it does happen, I will do, the, I will do this other thing. So you, I'm sure you can understand, Minister, why people are concerned. 
Equally worrying is the fact that one out of ten GPs are offering abortion care. Nine out of ten maternity units are offering abortion care. So this is under your watch, and you, you know, you're telling us to trust you, and you're saying, trust me, I, I'll sort this out in the event that, that, that uh, any woman is being denied an elective termination. I will sort this out. But you haven't sorted out the situation in ten of the in nine of the maternity units. So th there, there are issues of trust here. And that's why, uh, that's why we're here debating this motion, and that's why we need the assurance and the certainty that comes with ownership. And a leasehold is not ownership. In fact, the leader of the Green Party in 2017, and this is in the motion, said that the new NMH should not involve the creation of a lease arrangement, but rather the transfer of ownership. Nothing has changed in that time. He's dead right. He was dead right then, and he's right now. So I do hope, Minister, you understand where issues around trust have arisen, and some of the things that you have said have not helped in that regard. In fact, they have been counterintuitive, and Deputy that gives women pause to be very concerned. Deputy Deputy Ryan. Ryan. Minister, over the last week, there's been a lot of whitewashing. Ministers and backbenchers who previously had their doubts had those doubts swept away by a letter which contained no guarantee the full range of health options for women would ever be safeguarded. Maybe written on that page was a coded message to not rock the boat, to turn a blind eye to women's rights and to keep your nose firmly out of the truck and out of the business of vested interests. Vested interests. I'm bitterly disappointed that the Cabinet decided today to drive a coach and forth to the clear wishes of right-thinking people. Everyone I speak to is baffled as to why we can't own the land and the hospital. We've had lots of talk about this transaction being compared to buying an apartment. This is disingenuous attempt to discredit anyone who opposes this sellout. We now have a dodgy, intentionally fake uh, contract which could see the rent jump from €10 Euro a year to over a quarter of a billion euro over the lifetime of a lease. The Irish people have made it quite clear in recent referenda that we are a secular state and that religion is a private matter. What happens if the HSE is unable to stay for the duration of the tenancy or for some unforeseen reason the state needs to purchase the freehold site? The government parties have a long history of pandering to vested interests. Health care should be for the good of patients and service users and not for profit. The government should not have approved this deal in its current format. There were no meaningful or serious discussions in five or six years, according to St Vincent's Hospital Group at yesterday's committee, and Deputy Cullinan has spoken to you around that. At the very least, Minister, you should have removed the phrase clinically appropriate. There is broad consensus that this could be removed. There is no legal impediment to gifting the land. The government yet again is failing women and has serious questions to answer. The solution is simple. We must have a public hospital built on public land. Anything less calls into question the government's commitment to slauncher care. I understand that there are some Green TDs wrestling with their conscience. I appeal to them in particular to now to draw a line in the sand and to support this motion. Thank you. Minister, I fully support calls for a new National Maternity Hospital to be publicly owned and to be built on public lands. Unfortunately, your government is ploughing ahead. The women of Ireland have campaigned for health care that is free from outside influences for decades, and they need to have confidence in the type of health care that they get. Their concerns could have been addressed, and concerns around a complex legal deal could have been knocked on the head if the government had kept their word and bought the site into public ownership. The government said they wanted the land to be gifted to the state. But yesterday at the Health Committee, we found out that there was never any meaningful discussions under this government and this minister around the purchase or gifting of this site. Was the government ever serious about owning the site? It doesn't look like that, Minister. The argument against public ownership seems to be that it will cause delays. Now, nobody wishes to see this delayed further, but we're discussing building a hospital at the cost of €1 billion. Euros. The Minister for Health, the Taoiseach 
and the Tarnashta could have resolved this issue. It is absolutely shameful that the government decided to sign off on these plans this morning. But you will have to stand over that and you will have to explain that to your constituents. Nothing changed since it was paused. So it seems that committee hearings were basically a box ticking exercise. Now tonight should have been a chance for every TD to cast their vote, but the government will cynically not oppose the motion and speak out of both sides of your mouths yet again. Minister, the women of Ireland want a maternity hospital and we want a maternity hospital that is publicly owned and built on public lands. Thanks, Deputy, Deputy Clerk. Decades of women campaigning and fighting, and in some instances begging for health care. We are standing here today with a government that has signed off on a deal that fails to deliver a public hospital on public land. Instead, you have signed us up to some convoluted lease that will run for 300 years. It is obvious to the most uneducated person in economics out there that the investment of €1 billion Euro would have been much better protected by ensuring that we actually owned the land that we were spending that money on. But yesterday we learned that the Taoiseach, the Taunished and yourself, Minister, despite being asked to sit down with St Vincent Healthcare Group and negotiate that transfer, no meaningful engagement actually happened to do that. Despite the government's stance that the transfer of land was some form of legal quagmire, we also learned that the Sisters of Charity did that without precondition. There was no legal barrier. Is it any wonder that women are so concerned about this agreement when neither Taoiseach nor Minister from Health have made any serious attempts to have this land transferred, all while telling this House that transition wasn't possible? We all want this hospital. Lord knows the women of Ireland need this hospital. However, the real issue here is the failure of government to secure the land into public ownership. And that that phrase, clinically appropriate, that caused so much concern to so many stakeholders up to yesterday, seems to have completely disappeared. Poof, off out there into the ether, because Cabinet understands the meaning. There is now no need for legal guarantees. Trust us, take another leap of faith. Forget all the horrors that have happened in women's health care to date, because Cabinet understands. I don't know one woman who was willing to take another leap of faith with their health care, not even one, while barriers still exist out there. And Minister, you know well and truly that they do. So I'll go to Deputy Tully. Thank you. Um, Minister, I am very disappointed that the Cabinet agreed earlier today to sign off on the National Maternity Hospital going ahead on non-publicly owned land. And the question as to why the land could not be gifted to the state has never been answered. I mean, we have been told that the 299-year lease at the nominal rent is ownership in everything but name. But why can it not just be signed off and, and given at a nominal fee and make it ownership without question? I mean, the state's going to build a, a state-of-the-art hospital for the cost of €800,000 upwards. That's a huge investment of taxpayers' money, people's money. So people have the right to an assurance that the money invested will remain in public ownership and the fact that the hospital will be built on land not in state ownership is very worrying. And the leaders of the three government parties have all stated in recent times that they believe that the land should be publicly owned. I mean, the Taoiseach said last year in March that I'm of the view that hospitals which are predominantly or overwhelmingly funded by the state should be in state ownership. The Taunashta in 2019 stated here, it is our policy that the hospital will be publicly owned and the land on it will be in public control. And the leader of the Green Party in 2017 stated in the stall that the new National Maternity Hospital should involve not just the creation of a lease arrangement, but rather the transfer of ownership of the site to the state so that there is no uncertainty or lack of clarity on the ownership. No wonder constituents accuse politicians of promising one thing and delivering something else. I mean, also one of the key recommendations of the 2018 Day Report was when the state is paying for a hospital, it should own the hospital outright. And this avoids complicated government's arrangements, any chance of limited services, and it state guards the state's investment. So what we needed was a clean transaction whereby the Sisters of Charity gifted the land to, directly to the state. It was as simple as that. This would copper fasten the state ownership of the hospital and allay public fears. 
This makes infinitely more sense in protecting women's health care and the state's investment than a bizarre 299-year lease agreement. For too long in this country, women's Health care, and particularly reproductive health care, has been neglected. We all agree that this hospital is needed, is needed urgently, but it has been discussed and considered for almost a decade, and yet this government has still failed to get it right, and women deserve better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Tully. Minister. I have unfortunately straight after this, uh, but uh, Minister Butler uh, will be here. Um, colleagues, Ciarán Corla, it's been agreed by all sides that we urgently need a new state-of-the-art, secular, public, co-located national maternity hospital that provides all healthcare services to women and to infants. Um, this morning, that is exactly what government has agreed to. The new hospital will radically improve access to the best possible healthcare. It will provide specialist care for women via a physical corridor to St. Vincent's University Hospital. It will have single occupancy uh, ensuite rooms for all women with space for partners to stay. It will have single cot neonatal intensive care rooms and it will increase the number of cots from 35 to 50. It will increase the number of delivery rooms from 11 to 24. It will increase the number of operating theatres from 2 to 5. The number of gynaecology beds from 18 to 31. It will have appropriate bereavement facilities. It will be home to a range of important community-based healthcare services. The new hospital will be entirely secular. Its founding rules, which is the constitution of the NMH, state that there can be no religious ethos. It also states uh, that not only can the new hospital provide all services, the new hospital must provide all services. And the state, via the Minister for Health, will have the power to directly intervene if the hospital were to fail to meet uh, these requirements. The state will own the hospital and the state will own the land for the next 300 years. This has been confirmed by the HSE, the National Maternity Hospital, St Vincent's Healthcare Group and the Attorney General. The government added three decisions today in response to the concerns raised and discussed over the last two weeks. The first is that there will be an annual report on the operation of services at the new National Maternity Hospital for the next five years, or rather from five years from when it starts. The second is that I'm going to request the clinical director of the National Women and Infants Programme to scope out and bring forward a proposal on a centre of excellence for women's health. Uh, and the third is that the term clinically appropriate allows the new hospital to provide all legally permissible procedures in the areas of maternity, gynaecology, obstetrics, neonatology and gender recognition. The term clinically appropriate was added to the agreement by the HSC. Colleagues opposite are asking for a HSC run hospital. Well, it was the HSC that, that insisted on this phrase. The HSE wanted this phrase to protect and to future-proof women's health services. For years, women's health services have been squeezed by other services within hospitals. When pressure comes on for urgent access to facilities like diagnostics, beds, operating theatres, the doctors will tell you that it's often things like gynaecology lists in the operating theatres that get cancelled uh, first. We're determined to put an end to that. We are absolutely determined that the new hospital will be for healthcare services for women and for instance uh, infants and cannot um, be pressurised and pushed to the side by other pressures from other uh, services. I think we'll all agree we have incredible healthcare professionals working in uh, women's healthcare, in community, in hospital settings, in maternity, in gynaecology, in mental health, oncology, screening, well-being and many, many more. I've met many of them over the past few years, and I know colleagues have also met with many of these healthcare workers. We've seen with our own eyes the fantastic work they do. We've also seen the pressure that they're under, the daily pressure and the difficulties they face because of inadequate facilities. When I took office, I ensured women's healthcare was a top priority for this government. Our first ever Women's Health Action Plan was published earlier this year. The National Maternity Strategy is now fully funded, including hundreds of additional posts in maternity services around the country. We're seeing new infrastructure improvements with theatres refurbished, um, home away from home suites added to many of our 
of our maternity units. We're hiring lactation consultants to provide breastfeeding supports nationally. We're building a new national network of healthcare services. Between last year and this year, we're opening six specialist menopause clinics, um, a national network of 20 see and treat gynaecology clinics, six regional fertility clinics, and I am hoping to get funding uh, in the estimates for next year to start providing for the first time a publicly funded IVF treatment. Um, we're opening uh, six specialist endometriosis clinics. We're rolling out free contraception starting this year with uh, young women from 70, uh, age 17 to 25. We're setting up new mental health teams, including for eating disorders and perinatal mental health. The new National Maternity Hospital is absolutely central to this ongoing vision. It's the biggest investment in women's health care in the history of the state. And that and all of the guarantees that we've been discussing over the last few weeks in terms of clinical independence, operational independence, uh, no ability for any religious interference, uh, state-of-the-art facilities, um, and all services being provided. All of these are why the midwives, the nurses, the doctors in the NMH, but right around the country, um, are stating publicly and asking us all as legislators to support this really important uh, new hospital. The task now is to get the new hospital built as quickly as possible and I'm really looking forward to engagement with colleagues um, on an ongoing basis. I think we can all agree that we, we have a history in this country of taking too long to build hospitals. Indeed, it was pointed out to me this morning that just the procurement process for one of the hospitals in recent times, just the procurement process took two years. Right? We have a big advantage here. Planning permission is already in place. The detailed design is done. The legal frameworks uh, are in place. The business case is being developed. It's now going to be um, externally validated. Um, and so what I want to see and want to work with colleagues on is pushing this forward and, and, and whilst respecting everyone's views, genuinely respecting everyone's views, and that's why we added three new decisions to the memo this week that were not in the memo two weeks ago. Um, I hope we can all work together to really push and make sure that this hospital now gets built as quickly as possible. Gormagath. Let me begin by echoing Minister Donnelly's comments regarding the government's commitment to the development and improvement of women's health services. We know the infrastructure of our maternity hospitals leaves much to be desired. We know there are deficits in women's health services, in the choice of experience available to pregnant women, in the availability of mental health supports, physiotherapy, services for endometriosis and menopause, as well as difficulties with, with gynaecology waiting lists. We know this is the case and there's no point in hiding from that fact. However, in terms of our commitment to women's health, we have put our money where our mouth is and provided the investment needed to see these commitments through. For example, for the first time since its launch in 2016, we have adequately funded our national maternity strategy. For contrast, in 2020, just one and a half million euro was allocated to implement this strategy. This government increased the figure to 7.3 million in 2021 and again to 8.6 million in 2022, ensuring a renewed impetus to the implementation of the strategy. As raised in today's motion, the HICWA's overview report highlighted a number of areas where work is required to meet the standards. I note in particular the concerns regarding de deficiencies in maternity infrastructure. The HSC are currently working on a plan to address the infrastructural issues across our maternity services and to ensure the physical environment of our hospitals and units are in line with both HICWA standards and the vision of the National Maternity Strategy. Improving women's experience of and outcomes in the health service is, of course, much wider than maternity. As referenced earlier, €31 million Euro has been provided this year for a range of developments in terms of women's health. Some of these have already been referenced, but they include an additional €5 million Euro for the dedicated Women's Health Fund and the rollout of free contraception scheme for 17 to 25-year-olds later this year. In addition, a further £16 million to support women's health is embedded within other new measures for 2022 within the health vote in areas such as cancer, mental health and social inclusion budgets. And I think specifically in relation to mental health, where we now have Kian Corla, 19 perinatal mental health midwives in place in every single um, maternity hospital in the country. And we also have um, in total 75 staff working in relation to perinatal mental health. I recently visited the Rotunda to meet the team there. And um, there was 9,800 um, women presented to the hospital last year. 
um, to give birth and uh, 2,000 women actually received and needed the support of the perinatal mental health team. So a really important initiative. I have participated and listened to the intensive debates on this topic over the past two weeks and I am fully confident that there will be no religious ethos at the new National Maternity Hospital and all legally permissible services will be provided there as they are in the current hospitals at Hollis Street and that's the state's investment in this hospital and the provision of public health care services is fully protected. Following on from the Cabinet's decision today, I think now is the time to move on towards the delivery of this much needed new maternity hospital. Gorf Mahagut. very much, Minister. <coughs> we now go to Deputy Mairead Farrell. Sharing with Deputy Zellis Cronin and Ward. Gurmagat Chianchoria. Ara, 12 years ago, the Controller and Auditor General identified some of the key risks posed by this deal. And in, in a section of their report called Protecting the State's Property Interest, they identified several alarming details. These included the fact that there existed a fixed charge over the entire St. Vincent's Hospital site and a floating charge over all of the undertaking property and assets of SFHG, both present and future. The CNAG's worrying conclusion was that the St. Vincent's Healthcare Group had, and I quote, pledged publicly funded assets as security for bank finance for the development of its private hospital. In other words, the land on which we are going to build this hospital has been used as collateral for other transactions. It was used as collateral to raise debt and for the development of St Vincent's private hospital and commercial car park. As a result of this, Bank of Ireland now holds a charge on this land. So not only are you proposing to build our new national maternity hospital on land we don't even own, the group who owns the land have a charge on it held by Bank of Ireland, which is a potential risk to the state. The 2018 day report recommended that when the state is paying for a hospital, it should own it outright. That is the best outcome um, and way to safeguard state investment, option agreements notwithstanding. And two members of the HSE board also expressed governance concern if the state does not own it out outright. And as Thomas Hubert in the Currency.ie reported, St. Vincent's Holdings Group was granted a temporary reprieve from non-compliance with its debt covenants, but this was pandemic relief and it's now about to come to an end. And Minister, this deal was so bad, I, can't, I have to say I actually can't believe it's even gotten to this stage and I have to say I'm, I really am outraged that it has gotten to this point and that we've had to um, raise it continuously and that the women, so many women activists have been raising it for such a long period of time. And it's fraught with risks and uncertainties and it is unnecessarily compact, complex and this regards established policy design to protect state investment. And I have to say, Minister, I think it's a bad deal for women. It's also a bad deal for the taxpayer. And it's been created a risk to women's health and risks to the taxpayer. And I have to say, lastly, Minister, I would just say that for the parties who consider themselves to be so pro-business, you are terrible at doing business yourselves. The journey so far in the provision of a national maternity hospital that has, got, that has got us to this point has been a long and convoluted journey that has become unnecessarily marred in controversy. Our existing maternity hospital in Hollow Street is simply not fit for purpose, and the decision to relocate the hospital to a new site eight years ago was well within its time, where it can offer patients improved modern facilities as well as better care for its patients. However, since that decision was made, the process has been beset by delays and reasonable concerns over its ownership, its governance and control issues. For such an important and major health project, it is hard to fathom that after almost a decade of work expended on this project, that there is very little to show for it, apart from the escalating costs in, in its construction. A project that was originally to have costed in the region of 150 million is now being put at 500 million with an added cost of a four or 300 million for commissioning costs which includes fit out costs and transferring the hospital to a new site. The cost of the hospital has gone from its original target of 150 million to 800 million. Another example of gross overspending on hospital projects. Legitimate concerns have been raised by concerned citizens and medical professionals that have not been sufficiently addressed and remain matters that are causing friction and needless controversy. It is important that the National Maternity Hospital has a secular ethos and that both the hospital and the site it resides on should be fully owned and managed by the state. 
that the site is, is proposed to be transferred to a charitable entity called St. Vincent's Holdings has also raised concerns for many people worried that the hospital will be unduly influenced by a religious ethos. There is also a fear that the hospital's legal framework, which talks of clinically appropriate treatment, is already being shaped by this religious ethos. People are rightly concerned that the new hospital will fail to deliver health care that is not approved by the Catholic Church. The new maternity hospital and its administration, its operation and its oversight must, must represent in all its aspects the inclusiveness of a secular body and that is best achieved under full state ownership. Thank you. Deputy Cronin. Ken Corla, um, what a desperate disappointment this cynical government is for the women of this state. And what a desperate disappointment it is for anybody who is interested in, in public health care. The ownership of this land for our new National Maternity Hospital was right there within our grasp, but this dis disappointing and cynical government didn't fight for it. Now we hear the Chair of St Vincent's Healthcare Groups to be hauled in to correct the record, where he said the government had no serious or meaningful discussions to push for full public ownership. Yet in the same breath, the Women of Ireland and female government TDs are to accept a letter of comfort from this same source for their health and, more importantly, the future health of their children, their daughters and their granddaughters. This degrading government is not opposing our PMB. This floor show is so brazen, it's cowardly and it's cynical. The billion euro of public money built to, to uh, build a hospital on private land. Manana Heron heard but not heeded. In the uniform of the patriarchy, the leaders of Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and the Green Party, they tell us that they know better than us, that they know what's good for us, and they carry on regardless. This government has shown contempt for public health reform and your sisters in society by doggedly pursuing your belief that they know best, they know more, and that women should just put up, shut up and move on. Except the women and the men who have stood by us, who campaigned against this fudge, who rejected this ambiguity, who were incensed by the insult and uncertainty of clinically appropriate, will not move on. A hundred years of Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, wasn't enough ye seem to have tied us into a lease for 299 years. But the, but the resistance and the spirit of repeal, and that spirit will not be quenched. Repeal for some was only a veneer, a desire to be popular. But for Thaw from Na, women men on the heron, repeal was fundamental. So Kogorgeous live, ye heard us, but ye ignored us. But I can tell you that we are watching. And as most of the men on the other side of the house will know, women don't forget. Ward. Well, Michael, Carla. Uh, I want to start off by talking about a legacy of mistrust about religious orders having any connection with women's health care. I also want to talk about the historical abuse suffered by women and children at the hands of religious orders. And I also want to talk about the connection between church and state that led to this abuse of power. And so I'm a member of the Children's Committee that has been working through legislation on this historical abuse, whether that's in the mother and baby homes, whether that's institutional burials, including the bodies of children being dumped in septic tanks. And we listened to heartrending testimonies about forced adoptions. Women and children treated as commodities by church and state in baby factories. So if this government cannot see the upset that building a maternity hospital on land that is owned by a religious order, then you are more out of touch than I actually thought. And today, Jordan Leaders questions the Taoiseach reaffirmed the government's position that leasing the land from a religious order is effectively on the land. This is nonsense. It makes absolutely no sense. A lease is a lease. If I rent my home, I, rent, I do not own my home. The landlord owns my home. The sister of charity in the guise of St Vincent's Holdings are the owners and therefore the landlords of the land that the National Maternity Hospital will be built on. There is a yearly payment. This is not ownership of land. We are talking about a one billion investment in taxpayers' money being spent on this hospital. The state should own it outright. The Sisters of Charity previously promised to gift the land to the people of Ireland. And that means a public hospital on public land. The government now needs to make this happen, Minister. The control of the land is very important, and with the massive state investment should come full ownership. The state has been in the grip 
Our government's controlled by Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael since the inception of this state over 100 years ago. The reason that we need a National Maternity Hospital now is due to a lifetime of underinvestment in women's health care by both parties. We need a complete separation from church and state when it comes to women's health care. In fact, Minister, we need a complete separation from Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil when it comes to women's health care. And today you signed off on a, a deal that it's going to pass this through, but yet you're going to come in here and you're going to let this motion go through, so you don't want to be, have to be forced on it and to have the public outcry. This is definitely talking out of both sides of your and the public are saying through this, Minister, this is not the first time it's happened with CAMS, it's happened with other motions that have been put forward by oppositions, that the government sit over there, nod their head, let things go through and have no intention of putting things into place. It's a con job and you just need to cop on. Thank you, Deputy Ward. Now, Deputy Duncan Smith, sharing with Deputy Vanavetrick. Yeah, five minutes each, Count Coral. Thank you. Um, Minister, uh, at some indeterminate point last week, it became clear um, that the government were spinning their wheels on what was supposed to be an open and inclusive consultation on the various uh, documents. Uh, for me, it was clear during the, the Health Committee last week um, that the, the government were just stalling for time were just playing us out. It was like the end of Mr Smith goes to Washington. It was like Mr Donnelly comes to committee and comes to briefings and comes to the, the doll and just talks the clock down, talks the days down until this moment. Uh, and we wonder why people feel uh, so cynical about politics and politicians. And this has been thrown across the floor uh, from opposition to government and government to opposition. Uh, but for me, over the last number of months, who is sitting on the business committee and has seen multiple attempts uh, to block statements and debate on uh, this or, uh, for the last number of months, uh, that we had to come up with a very special arrangement for a Thursday sitting a few weeks ago. At that special arrangement, the minister said, we will, when the documents are released, when the lease is ready, we will have a full debate. Then two weeks ago, marched into Cabinet, we're going to push this through, it was stopped, say, right, we'll give it a couple of weeks and we'll, 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 have, a, we'll have an open debate. And that didn't really happen. We had chats, but we, ha we definitely didn't have, the debate certainly wasn't open. Um, we saw it at committee, as I say, we saw it over the previous months at the business committee. Uh, we're seeing it now in terms of the fact that this is not going to be opposed, that there will be no vote on this. Uh, and to even extend the cynicism, what we saw on social media a couple of hours ago was Minister Donnelly have a video extolling the virtues of this deal that was retweeted 200 odd times in the space of a couple of minutes by ro what looked like robo accounts or bot accounts. You know, I mean, this is crazy stuff. And why, was, why did that happen? Because the minister and the government know that they don't have the support of the women of Ireland and the people of Ireland on this issue. They just do not have it. Uh, and the, the cast thing is, no one will be looking one way or another how many tweets a tweet gets, but it just shows you the insecurity that the government has in relation to their stand on this. Uh, and for us, we are very clear in our position and have been for a number of years now in terms of the CPO and our desire to see the land CPO. We asked how many of the three ministers that were in power asked for the advice of the Attorney General on that. We did not get a clear answer. Uh, Minister Donnelly said that he sought advice of the Attorney General. We did not get any indication as to what that advice actually said, never mind what the previous two ministers uh, asked from their various Attorneys General. Uh, and we still have, despite all the talk that has taken place in this chamber and in committee uh, and elsewhere over the last number of weeks and months, we in the Labour Party still have massive concerns about the ownership, control and governance of the new National Maternity Hospital. And we're not the only ones, and we're not the only ones in this House, and we're not the only ones in politics. We know across the legal profession and across the clinical profession, uh, we have Dr Chris Fitzpatrick now of the Coombe came out in the last mm -hmm. couple of days who said that he felt that clinicians won't have the necessary guarantees that they would be able to carry out uh, the uh, various uh, procedures that are uh, legally uh, permissible in this state. That's where we are. That's, so so, so, so where, are, where are we now? What can we, it's, it's gone through Cabinet. The Minister said that the design is done and going to push through to procurement. So here's where we are. We have an imperfect ownership uh, situation. That's, no matter what, what, no matter what way the government try and dress it up, it is not 
uh, the perfect in the words of the Taoiseach, uh, when he, before he was Taoiseach, where he said he wanted fully public ownership land. We do not have that. That's a fact. We do not have it. We have the 300-year lease. That is imperfect. And we have the golden share model, which means that from this day, 300 years into the future, every woman in Ireland will hope, one, that the incumbent Minister for Health is pro-choice, and that two, that that minister, that he or she will never have to use their golden share. That's, that's where we're at. And if anyone thinks that that's a perfect model, if anyone thinks that that's something that should ever be used again or should ever be used now, then they're living in fantasy land. Because that's where we're at. Imperfect ownership and a model that means that every uh, woman in Ireland will have that in their stomach in terms of uh, concern and worry uh, that this golden share uh, will have to be used. And we only have to look at the United States in the last couple of weeks to see how uh, the situation can change uh, in a matter of moments. Uh, I'll hand over now to Bibedge. Uh, thank you. And, uh, Minister, earlier today, on behalf of Labour, I expressed our strong disappointment to the Taoiseach at the decision that has been taken today by Cabinet. And uh, as I said, and as uh, my colleague Deputy Duncan Smith has said, we continue in Labour to stand firm in expressing our strong concerns about uh, ongoing issues with the control, the ownership and the governance of the new National Maternity Hospital. Uh, we do uh, thank uh, Minister Donnelly for the engagement we've had in the last two weeks and we absolutely acknowledge the need for a new National Maternity Hospital to be built to provide women with the health care that we so badly need. But we're very disappointed that the engagement and the two-week delay did not lead to any uh, change or any substantive improvement in the deal that was on offer. And we should have learnt by now the need to get this right because we have such a long legacy in Ireland of church and state interference in the exercise of women's right to reproductive health care. Many of us fought for decades to see the Eighth Amendment repealed and when we achieved that finally in 2018, that was only four years ago, that we were able to introduce legal abortion here in Ireland. And we know from experience, our own bitter experience, experience elsewhere, that these hard-won gains for women's rights and women's reproductive rights can be reversed or undermined all too easily. And indeed we're seeing that clearly in recent weeks with the very concerning signs uh, in the US Supreme Court with the awful prospect that the pro-choice landmark decision Roe v Wade could now be overruled. And we're seeing a whole new generation of women in America having to face the prospect of fighting again for pro-choice rights that were won there some decades ago and may now be overturned. And apart from that real, uh, real and valid fear that we have about the overturning or reversal of rights won, we also have the principle, the principle position of putting billions, putting a billion of state money into a, into the, into a premises that will not be constructed on state-owned land. And again, we have a long legacy in Ireland of investing public money into building up the infrastructure uh, of, uh, of voluntary hospitals and schools on sites that are owned by religious orders or their proxies or successor companies. And indeed, I've spoken before in this House about the well-established practice where religious orders divest their assets from their own ownership and into the ownership of lay-run trusts, which can often have a more hardline approach to negotiation with the state than the religious orders which preceded them. And that's, that's the context in which we distrust the steel. That's the context for our ongoing concerns. And that's the context for our real and, and pressing uh, uh, urgent need to see this uh, National Maternity Hospital built on publicly owned land. And the two-week delay has not resolved our concerns. Indeed, our engagement has made, has made our, our resolve the stronger that the state, the government, should have have retained the leverage power of the CPO. And I spoke today with the Taoiseach about figures I just got from on board Planola about the actual length of time it takes to, to resolve a CPO. The average number of weeks this year to dispose CPO cases is 20.4 weeks, less than five months. And so in a context where we've now waited nine years and we've seen incremental improvements undoubtedly in the deal and offer, uh, we're uh, we, we removed from ourselves, from the state, the option of a CPO and therefore re removed that bargaining power. And so we're now in the position uh, uh, that the government has taken this less than optimal deal, the imperfect deal, as Deputy Smith has said. We know it's less than optimal. We know it's less than perfect because we know from what Minister Donnelly and others have said that the government wanted the site to be in public ownership, that Attorney General's advice was sought by at least one health minister on the merits of a CPO. And yet that was not pursued. And instead, uh, the government has settled 
for this less than optimal deal. And as a result, we are letting down women in Ireland and we are letting down uh, the principle of church-state separation. And what we've got is conditional ownership. It's ownership of, of a sort, but it's not outright ownership. It's not freehold ownership. It is leasehold interest. And however long a leasehold is, it remains conditional ownership. And the conditions are clearly set out in the legal documents. The conditionality of appointment of three directors, the right to appoint three directors from St Vincent's Healthcare Group, the right to have a rotating chair every three years, the right to have a penalty rent, and that phrase, that phrase that so many of us have picked up on and are concerned about, of clinically appropriate, which clearly qualifies the availability of all legally, uh, legally uh, permissible services. And so these are the conditions consequent on the leasehold arrangement, and these are the reasons why we, we continue to have such valid, solid and substantive concerns about the deal that has been done. And that's why at this very late stage, Minister, we are still calling on the government to, to look at again at this, to look again at this, to go back and seek a better deal, as has been done. This is a better deal than was previously on the table from the St Vincent's Healthcare Group, so it can be improved upon. And if you were to go back to the St Vincent's Healthcare Group, you would have a united opposition who all want to see Thank this hospital Deputy. built on publicly owned land in the interest of women's reproductive health care. Holly Kern, sharing with Deputy Roshan Shortall. Thank you, Ken Corda. Incarceration, uh, mass graves, forced family separation, physical, psychological and sexual abuse. The history of partnerships between church and state concerning maternity and women's health care represents some of the darkest parts of our past. It is a tragically recurring pattern when men in positions of power collaborate to make decisions about women's bodies. This oppressive regime was often subtle and invisible. It was enforced by social norms, wrapped up in caring language, and it was found in the limitation of medical procedures. Most importantly, concerns, questions and objections were disregarded, denied and shouted down. While this doll still debates legislation to deal with the legacies of that cruel and twisted system, today it is abundantly clear that this government has learned nothing from our history. That gifting our National Maternity Hospital to St Vincent's set up by the Sisters of Charity is, is even up for discussion, disregards and compounds the suffering that many thousands of people have experienced at the hands of the church and state. In addition, genuine, genuine concerns of mothers have been dismissed as misinformation. Medical practitioners and legal experts have been disregarded. People have been labelled conspiracy theorists for asking questions. TDs who supported repeal seem to think this somehow shields, shields them from any kind of criticism. From the outset, the government's handling of the National Maternity Hospital plans has been contradictory, confusing and inconsistent. Despite all the government's spin and claims, there are three fundamental questions which have not been resolved. Firstly, why is the government gifting a €1 billion Euro hospital to a private company? On that point alone, this deal should not be going ahead. Secondly, why are the Sisters of Charity not giving the site over to the state as promised? We have been told that a 300-year lease is essentially transferring the land, then why are we not just doing that? What is their reason or motivation for retaining ownership? Thirdly, what is meant by clinically appropriate? That there has been so much debate about how this could be interpreted is in and of itself evidence that it could be interpreted in many ways. It is unbelievable that that key term remains ambiguous. These questions have been asked repeatedly by members of opposition and in particular by female leaders. I'm raising gender because it is deeply relevant. This state has a horrendous record on women's health, even up to this government, when it was required to have a dual motion seeking an implementation plan for our national maternity strategy. The women of Ireland, the people who will be using this hospital, are being ignored. Another government that knows better than women. Patriarchy and misogyny run so deep in this society, often people cannot even see it. Women have run, won the right to control their bodies. It was a long and hard-won battle opposed by politicians and religious orders that should never be put in doubt again. But today it has, in full knowledge of all the concerns, all the unanswered questions, 
and all the legal and medical ambiguities, the government decided to, have to plough ahead because it knows best. It knows what's best for women, not women themselves. Government TDs and ministers like myself have received countless emails and messages on the issue for women and mothers. I wondered you even stop for one second to think that they may have a point before those of you who take the time to reply tell them all the ways that they're wrong. This decision is wrong on so many levels. But like so many bad decisions, because things have gone on too long, it's being used as an excuse. Let's not reflect on how badly this has been handled by the ministers of Health, Radcar and Harris, and now Minister Donnelly. Instead, let's accuse those raising legitimate concerns of delaying things. That argument will not cut it this time. People see through it. Most importantly, the girls and women of Ireland see through it. The solution has always been incredibly simple. A state-owned and controlled national maternity hospital built on state lands and through the use of state funds. Not only is this the proper way to conduct healthcare projects, not to mind one billion euro of taxpayers' money, but it removes any possible doubt about governance and medical procedures. And most importantly, it ensures that the will of the women in Ireland will be respected. Why is it so hard for the government to accept? And when the issue inevitably arises, where will the minister be? He can't say he didn't know. He can't say he was not warned. But the real hard truth is that it will be the women and girls of Ireland who will bear the brunt of his mistakes. They again will suffer because the government thought it knew better than them. That will be his legacy. Another government making the wrong healthcare decisions for women. Short uh, thanks very much. I welcome this uh, motion fr from uh, Sinn Féin. I want to say at the outset, uh, the government is displaying incredible disrespect for this parliament and for democracy by their actions. We've already had three private members' uh, motions uh, calling for full public ownership of the new National Maternity Hospital. The government has voted uh, along with those motions. Um, and today is the latest one now, where the government is faced with a motion that says that we must pursue the full realisation of the promise that was made by the Sisters of Charity to gift the land to the people of Ireland and engage at the highest level with the new ownership group behind St Vincent's Healthcare Group, St Vincent's Holdings, to secure full public ownership of the site and new building. Now, it is the height of hypocrisy that on the very day that this government rammed through a cabinet decision to plough ahead with their proposal, uh, that you actually sit back and pretend that you're supporting this motion. I mean, are you not ashamed of that? Like, what has this government come to that they're behaving like this in such an utterly disrespectful way? I wish the minister himself was here, you know. I don't know where he is. He's probably doing more media. Uh, he's completely undermining this parliament and our democracy, as I say. Look, two weeks ago, we were told that there was going to be a pause. There was going to be an opportunity to address those two key issues, the question of public ownership and the question then of that phrase that nobody understands, the phrase of a pr clinically appropriate. Um, in relation to ownership, of course, we know after yesterday's meeting that this government has never, on any occasion, seriously approached St Vincent's with a view to purchasing that site or getting them to gift it. So that was confirmed for us yesterday. The other thing, of course, that was confirmed today was that in spite of all of the promises, including from yourself, Minister Butler, about reassuring everybody there was no problem about this phrase, um, and in spite of several people then who are proponents of this project saying that they weren't sure exactly what that, that phrase meant. Uh, and three, we have had three different interpretations of that phrase. And for that reason, then last Thursday, when you were here beside the Minister Donnelly, and Minister Donnelly accepted that we had a point, that he was going to reflect on this and consider it over the weekend. And there was endless spinning going on last weekend about some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of definition or removing that phrase or a codicil, ridiculously. And yet today, you know, none of that. 
meant anything. And this thing was rammed through. And the idea, you know, of the government saying that they're, they're going to add a note to the memo to, to Cabinet. I mean, adding a note, a letter from the Minister, a letter from any body, carries no weight whatsoever in relation to contract law. We have a number of uh, uh, legal documents which contain that phrase, and unless there's a definition of that phrase, it will continue to be highly ambiguous and will undoubtedly be challenged over the years ahead. The other thing I would have to say is that in relation to public health care, where does this government now stand in relation to its supposed commitment to public health care and to Sláinte Care? I mean, all you've been doing is paying lip service to that. Your decision today shows that you're not at all serious about Sláinte Care and that what you are engaged in is the same as what Vincent's are engaged in, and that is promoting private health care. And of course, in relation to your own commissioned reports, the de Butler report, that came down strongly in favour of the separation of the, the, the two elements of public and private, and in relation to Catherine Day, you're completely disregarding those very significant reports that, that, that uh, were provided. The other thing I would just say to you that you are now entering a contract with an organisation that we know nothing about, St Vincent's Holdings. This is an organisation for whom the Sisters of Charity had to get approval from the Vatican to transfer their shareholding. We know the Vatican agreed to their proposal or their petition, as it's called, and we know nothing Thank about what deputy. was contained in that petition. You're highly irresponsible as a government in what you're doing, and we're going to pay a huge price for this in the future. Thank you very much, Deputy Shortall. Now, uh, Deputy Breed Smith is sharing with our colleagues, Deputies Murphy, Kenny, and Barry. Sinead. Uh, I mean, it's hard to know what's left to be said about this debacle other than to, for me to really uh, be very, very critical of how your government has behaved, Minister, over the last two weeks. You brought us in here into repeated committee meetings, onto media debates, under a pretense. And that pretense was that you were willing to engage and listen to the concerns of the opposition of the women of Ireland, of those of us who uh, really marked out the repeal movement, but you haven't listened to anything. In, in all of this, it was just talk down the clock, drag it out and pretend that we're going to give the opposition some kind of change to this very convoluted, complex document and to assuage their fears about wording around uh, clinically appropriate uh, and continue to argue against them about the ownership of the land. And what I've found remarkable throughout this whole process, and I've been involved in all of the debates, is the fact that the minister can sit there happily and say, black is white. And you can pick up a document, I could pick up a document, read to him, say, no, that's not what St. Vincent's holding say. They say black is black. And you get back up and you say, no, black is white. And you've done it today. And your speeches here today have done it. In fact, Stephen Donnelly's speech starts by saying, we now have the urgently needed secular, public and co-located hospital. It is not co-located. It is fully integrated with St. Vincent's Healthcare Group. It belongs to a group that has public, private and St. Michael's. And that's very, very clear from the documents and from the business case that St. Vincent's uh, Healthcare Group made. It is also being paid for by public money. The taxpayers out there who today, tomorrow and next week are struggling to meet, make ends meet in this era of hyperinflation are watching this unfold while a huge chunk of their taxpayers' money is going to fund private suites for consultants in a public hospital. Outrageous. And it has been done under a cloud of secrecy and doubt and dismissing of people's concerns with the legacy of the church and in particular the Sisters of Charity order in this state. To dismiss that is utter, utter disgraceful hypocrisy from a government. Of course, I know your own personal position because you led a very active campaign to try and secure a no vote in the repeal movement among your own party. You led that campaign personally and obviously your position on the question of choice has not changed. And this is the worrying thing because as we move forward into a new era, let's say Sinn Féin continue to top the polls. Let's say they sweep the next election and trump all of the rest of the parties out of it and we attempt to form a left government. 
that left government with this document will never be able to take full control and ownership of our uh, hospital that was built with public money. Never. Because one of the clauses in the reduced rent is to say that St Vincent's holdings will never be challenged by the state and taken off the pitch. Right? So just bear that in mind. And also bear in mind that people more conservative you on, than you on the question of reproductive rights could someday be in control and could actually challenge the legal rights that we have, uh, the meagre legal rights that we've gained through repeal. I just want to point out one other hypocritical act. We can't CPO. You're going to delay it. You're going to delay this. You're going to delay that. And it's always put in the context as if those of us in opposition caused the last nine-year delay. The last nine-year delay was the fault of St Vincent's Healthcare Group and the Sisters of Charity, who were utterly determined to hold on to the ownership of that land, despite whether it was morally right or, or, or legally possible or not. And you say we can't CPO. Here's a document of a CPO order on St Vincent's lands in Ellen Park from the NTA. The NTA, the National Transport Authority, or CPO, CPOing compulsory purchasing land from the nuns to build uh, bus connects. Now that has been done, will be done without a whimper. We could not do it on behalf of the women of Ireland. Disgraceful. Deputy Murphy. Thanks, uh, Minister, <clears throat> to say the last two weeks have been a sorry saga is, is a, an underestimation. And in the last nine years, successive governments have had a chance to get this right. And they've, in their opinion, they've got it very, very wrong. And we all, we all agree that maternity services in Ireland, um, the places where women um, have, ch have children, are very antiquated. We all agree with that, and it needs to be modernised. Um, and what the heart of the debate has been, and not only in the last nine years, is in relation to religious interference in healthcare. And that has had a sorry, sorry past. Um, and we have to look at the past, uh, the present and the future. And the past, as I said, has been religious interference in relation to women's health care. And it's been a sorry, sorry past. In the present, we have a system uh, that's two-tiered, that uh, is private and public, and is, causes fault lines across society. And in situations where, uh, if you live in a certain part of Ireland, you still can't get access to abortion services. That's fact. And the, the, and the future is, is what we don't know. Uh, and that's what kind of leaves this ambiguity in relation to the 300 years uh, um, um, in clause. But there's one thing we know, Minister, is the generation that exists now uh, is a generation that throws the yoke of um, Christian uh, doctrine away. Uh, and it throws um, all the inequality that existed before. It has the shape of marriage equality and repeal. And that's the generation that exists now. And that's the generation that will accept nothing less than separating church from state. And time will tell whether the government have made an enormous mistake. Um, and people will look back in maybe 10, 15 years and why did they do, why did they hand that uh, piece of land over to a private entity? Thank you. Thanks, Ken Carla. Um, breathtaking cynicism has characterised the government's uh, ramming through of this proposal. And the height of the breathtaking cynicism is going to be this evening, when the government is going to vote in favour of a motion that calls for the government to secure full public ownership of the site and new building on the very same day that they've done the very opposite. I mean, it's, it's just disgusting, the level of cynicism. Um, you're all used to telling untruths in election time and then breaking all those promises. You look at the Green Party and what they will do today. But to do it on the very same day, to hand over the land and the hospital in the morning and then in the evening to vote in favour of a resolution to do the opposite is absolutely uh, incredible. If I only have 10 seconds left, just because you keep saying it's equivalent to ownership doesn't make it so. If you look at the legal documents, it's very clear this is not ownership whatsoever. Mick Barry. The chair of the St Vincent's Hospital Group, James Manton, told the Eroctus Committee on Health yesterday, St Vincent's Hospital Group is a secular organisation. Well, St Vincent's Hospital Group 
still has Saint Vincent in its name? Does it not still have religious statues and icons in its grounds and in its hospital? And why is it that at the same time as that contribution was being made, that a quick check on the Sisters of Charity website uh, would, you'd see the following statement. Healthcare is provided in an atmosphere of Christian love and compassion, operating according to the values of the Sisters of Charity. So is this a lay Catholic successor organisation or a secular organisation? I think the answer to that is pretty clear. Now, Fianna Fáil might have calculated the odds here, cynically saying that their voter base tends to be older, their voter base tends to be more conservative, and maybe they won't lose much ground as a result of this decision. There's no Fine Gael deputies that I can see in the House. I think their voter base might be a little bit different. Abraham Lincoln once said, Minister. oh, there is, there is, so I'll address it to yourself, Minister. Abraham Lincoln once said, that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you won't fool all the people all the time. I hope I have that quote right, but you know the one that I'm referring to. Now, you jumped on the repeal bandwagon very late in the day, but I think it will be a lot clearer to people who gave you a degree of support around that, that in the struggle to separate church and state in this country, you know, Fine Gael, uh, where you stand in relation uh, uh, to that. And, and other issues as well, uh, Catholic control and influence uh, in other hospitals around uh, the country. Finally, in relation to the Green Party, they used to say of the Labour Party that it, it wrestled with its own conscience, but the Labour Party won in the end. And we see that in relation to uh, the Green Party uh, today. The government's cynical decision to support the motion uh, might get it off the hook of the embarrassment of Deputy um, Harrigan voting against uh, the uh, uh, motion today. But I think the people who voted Green in 2020 We'll see what's going on here, and they will remember the stance that the Green, ta Green Party have taken on this come the next election. Thank you very much, Deputy Barry. Deputy Tyler Tobin, please. Mila Margaret, Akan Corlia. Uh, from the outside, I want to reiterate that Aintu policy would be the building of a public uh, hospital on public land. And we believe that both the Children's Hospital and the Maternity Hospital should have been trilocated on a hospital on the periphery of the M50. Um, it is a big mistake for both of those hospitals to be located uh, in the locations that they're being built in at the moment. Uh, and we believe that these hospitals should be run by the state. But we're in a, in a situation where the government has to make a decision on the basis of an or organic system that has grown over decades. Uh, and I believe at this stage that we need to actually go ahead and build a national uh, maternity hospital as soon as we can. Uh, I want to thank the National Maternity Hospital for organising the briefing that it gave to the opposition parties in Hollis Street last week, um, <clears throat> where the minister and the master of the hospital were present to take questions. And it's incredible, but AIM2 was the only opposition party uh, that attended that meeting. And given that this issue has consumed pretty much all of the bandwidth in this echo chamber for the last month, I would ask, ask questions to why Sinn Féin, the Social Democrats, People for Profit and the Labour Party didn't attend the Hollis Street uh, uh, meeting to pose questions to the hospital itself. And the key questions for us in all of this is what's the cost to the health of mothers for each year that the building of a new maternity hospital is delayed? And that's a key issue. We want to know what are the number of wards that are operating at overcapacity right now in the National Maternity Hospital? What's the patient to doctor ratio, the patient to nurse, uh, nursing ratio, the patient to consulting ratio? How many babies are in the neonatal intensive care unit vers versus what's the actual capacity of those particular units. We want to know how long does it take to cross the city of Dublin from Hollis Street to St. Vincent's Hospital in an ambulance on an international rugby uh, Saturday if a, a mother is suffering from a life-threatening emergency. That's the key question that, that's in front of us at the moment. And we also want to know how long would it take to start from scratch to build another maternity hospital in another location if this deal collapsed? Because there's a significant chance that this deal could have uh, collapsed. And if we're going back to the drawing board, we need to know how long it's going to take. Is it 10, 15 or 20 years before such a hospital uh, would be built? These are the critical 
life and death issues that should be at the centre of the debate, but they haven't been at the centre of the debate whatsoever over the last number of months. And it never ceases to amaze me here that if there's a choice between a bread and butter or a health issue on one hand, or a culture war on the other hand, that most parties of the left will go to the culture war like a moth to a flame. And people I talk to at home are consumed by the fact that there's one million people on hospital waiting lists, many for years, that there are hundreds of people on trolleys each and every day, that A&E delays are now the worst on record, and that seriously ill people are waiting 13 hours for admission into those A&Es, that we have a mental health pandemic in this country, and that hospitals made uh, had claims for 105,000 mistakes last year. Now, you'd have to be on a pretty high income level or a gold-plated insurance uh, policy before that these health concerns will be relegated below to whether or not there's a crucifix in a hospital or not. You'd have to be fairly well off and fairly good access to health care for those issues to mean less than whether or not there's a crucifix in a hospital or not. It's astounding that Peter Boylan's tweet uh, last night made the big reveal uh, on Twitter that there's a chaplaincy in St. Vincent Hospital, and this chaplaincy provides information on what TV channel that a person can access mass on if they want. Is this where we are in Ireland in 2020? Forget about the one million people on hospital waiting list. Hold the front page. There's a mass in the chaplaincy in St. Vincent's. It's incredible what's going on in this country at the moment. And I believe right under the surface of much of these debates, there is a, an anti-Catholic invective. And I've heard some of the language that has been used on the radio and the, the television, and indeed in the chambers uh, in, in the last number of weeks. From Aon O'Riordan's desire to vet civil servants for their level of Catholic faith, to his call to get them out of the schools, to the Social Democrats motion which says the Catholic ethos was a threat to women's health care, to solidarity people before profit blaming the education in Catholic schools for violence against women. All of these are untrue and much of it borders on hate speech in my view. For hundreds of years in this country, the health service and the education service was provided by the Catholic Church and it was done by the volunteer work of men and women. Indeed, the chaplaincy, which was attacked by Peter Boylan's tweet, was one of those many organisations and chaplaincies which provided comfort and consolation at great risk to themselves, to believers and non-believers during the darkest days of the COVID crisis. And they were reminded that the only profession that was not thanked at the official government remembrance for COVID were the priests and nuns in this country who buried our dead, who consoled our families at great risks to themselves while the people who wrote those speeches were working from home at the time. Um, it's an incredible situation. If you want to find Catholic ethos in this country, look no further to Sister Stan, Brother Kevin, Father Peter McVerry, and Sister Concilio. These are the people who are picking up the tab in areas of government neglect. Priests, parish, and religious people right across the country are moving mountains to help refugees fleeing the Ukraine and sending supplies to the Polish border. There have been great wrongs that have been carried out by the church in the past, but there has been great good delivered for generations too. And for every wrongdoer, there were dozens of good people doing the best that they could for the right reasons. And there's hardly a family in this state that has not benefited from Catholic health care or education in the last century. Remember, in the darkest parts of our institutional past, the state was equally culpable in those situations. Now, our healthcare service has grown organically into a pluralist model. Voluntary organisations with different ethos have in the main built a health service that we have today. Now, Ireland should be a pluralist republic. Catholic, Protestant and dissenters should have the right to be who they are without fear or favour from the state. Pluralism makes Ireland richer, stronger and more diverse as well. Now, I hear parties saying that the ground should be gifted to the state. Sinn Féin is well over 100 properties in the state at the moment. I would suggest that maybe Sinn Féin gift some of their properties to the state. See, the thing about it is, it's easy to be generous with other people's property. It's much too easy. And people shouldn't ask others to do what they won't do themselves as well. Um, the, my, my whole worry about this issue at the moment is 
that this could be delayed for another 15 years. It is right and proper to ask the questions. It is important that we test this contract to the full extent. But if we see a situation where there is no evidence proffered to why it should be stopped, and it is stopped, I think that the, the mothers and women of Ireland will suffer as a result. And one term that I have a difficulty that's been cited over and over again in this debate is the issue of whether or not it's clinically appropriate. Now, what does clinically appropriate mean? It means professionally recognised standard of medical care. All hospital decisions should be based on whether something is clinically appropriate or not. For if you delete the word clinically appropriate, it means that an ideology or a religion or some other issue has to come in on top of it. But the idea to say that doctors should make ideological decisions, should make religious decisions, and should ignore the clinical appropriateness of a decision is absolutely hard to believe. People, people are asking that clinically inappropriate decisions will be made uh, in hospitals. And what we need to do as a state is to make sure that the highest standard of science and medical uh, uh, knowledge is at the heart of the decisions that we make. The truth of the matter is that doctors and, and healthcare professionals that I have spoken to are really frustrated with regards to the language that has been used about their ability to provide services. If you go to anybody in Hollis Street or the National Maternity Hospital or St. Vincent's, they're phenomenally frustrated at their professionalism, which has been undermined wholesale repeatedly in the debates that have been had uh, over the last uh, number of months on this issue. Now, AINTU is a human rights uh, party. We believe, first and form foremost, that the health of the mother and the life of the mother should be protected in every single circumstance. After that, we believe that the lives and the health of the sons and daughters should be protected uh, as well, if possible. And we're, we're basically looking at a situation where Fine Gael TDs and senators have been coming out, some of them to say that they kind of oppose this deal. I believe it's deeply hypocritical. This is Fine Gael's baby. It has been promised for years. The real questions that I believe, as a doll, we should be asking is, why are we talking about something that was first announced in 2008 and again in 2013? Why is there a, a cost increase from 150 million to eight, over 800 million on this particular project? Why are the private clinics that are already attached to Hollis Street, are they going to be shifted onto the site? But none of this information is being tested and teased properly because of ideological predis predisposition in relation to this battle. Gurmagath. Thank you very much, Deputy Tobin. I can't. We'll go to the Rural Independent Group, Deputy Michael Collins, sharing with colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Dan, you've had your say, so hang on there a minute, please. Yeah. The, thank you. The National Maternity Hospital at Hollis Street is overcrowded. We need a new one. Built to modern specifications, full stop. Let's get on with it and stop blaming the nuns for everything. The nuns are easy targets for populist left politicians to attack because they know that the nuns do not have uh, expensive public relations teams and are not in the business of doing media. It is important to point out that the Sisters of Charity are giving away land worth over 50 million for free to build a hospital. They will have absolutely no say in the running of the hospital in any way, an objective, deb uh, an objective debate that would be cause for positivity. However, in this case, the nuns who have been under sustained attack simply because they are Catholic have been lambasted and uh, targeted by critics who are more concerned with gaining lines in the newspaper or time on the airwaves than anything else. Why does the Health Committee have to delay the process even longer? After all, St. Vincent's Healthcare Group does not want to sell this land, but will give it to the HSE under a 299-year lease. So this deal would take the new hospital into the 24th century before ownership would become an issue. And even then, it is unlikely any court would say the hospital should be removed. Who will own the hospital buildings? The answer is the HSE. But after 299 years of a leasehold, the hospital ownership will revert to St. Vincent Hospital. But there is nothing to indicate that even then, the nuns, if the order is still around, would have any say in its running. Is this argument common? Yes, absolutely. In fact, about 99% of Irish apartments are purchased under a long uh, lease agreement, and ownership is not disputed. 
It is a very standard contract that has become, for, uh, become for whatever reason, a major political debate. However, uh, will the state manage the con uh, to control the cost in this building of the new hospital, given the massive cost overrun in the Children's Hospital at St. James's Hospital? The state will be seeking much tighter oversight this time around. However, the government have a dismal track record when it comes to such projects. All indications point to this becoming another runaway cost project. Deputy McGrath. Yeah, no, we'll um, uh, ministers, first of all, I'd like to say something, and if there are nuns listening, I'd like to say something that they didn't hear coming out of this chamber yet, until perhaps right now. Thank you very much. Here, here. Because nobody has yet said thank you. I don't think in government or out of government or in opposition. All everybody has done was try to pick fault find everything they could possibly wrong with it, all because of this anti-religion agenda that is going on in Ireland at present. And I think it's absolutely outrageous. I was talking to an extremely intelligent person the other evening, and he was watching this whole debate going on with the last couple of weeks. He was listening to all the different political commentary, and of course he said about the hatred that seemed to be seeping out of uh, certain politicians' mouths when they were speaking about the Sisters of Charity. And this was his comment. And it was along the lines of, why did the Sisters do it this way and why not that way? Quite simply, because they own the land. And they wanted to do it this way. And I think it's extremely fair. 300 years at 10 euros a year. What part of that don't, does, does not anybody understand? That is, in effect, gifting it to the state. And if this is the way they wanted to do it, and if this was the rules they were laying down, isn't that fine and well and good? And why can't people accept that? But the reason they can't is because people want to forget and ignore the good work that was done by the Catholic Church in Ireland. And of course bad things happened, and of course there was bad people, there was bad priests, and there was bad everybody, but there was bad everybody in, in every walk of life. But think about the extremely kind and good people, young boys and young girls who devoted and gave up their lives to, to, for what they believe in, and that was God. But of course there's an awful lot of politicians here, they can't believe in God, because they think they're God themselves. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, Count Corla. Um, I'm glad to get the opportunity to talk on this very important, so important matter here this evening. And we certainly do need a new maternity hospital here in, 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 in the city of Dublin and part of the country as well. And it's, I can't understand how these people that are, are, are objecting to this can't understand that they're, they're getting lands bought uh, over 50 million, 50 or 60 million. Uh, mostly free of charge, all to 10 euros a year for 299 years. God Almighty, so 299 years is several lifetimes. And uh, I, 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 I can't understand it. And especially some of the people that are, uh, you know, against this deal, I, I just can't understand it. And, and, you know, the debate around the delivery of the new mater National Maternity Hospital and its re relocation fails to take full account of the substandard maternity f facilities in other hospitals and promises made by the last few governments to provide new and improved standards of care for women. In fact, four upgraded maternity hospitals have been promised, but n none of them has actually been delivered. And we're being critical now of, of the government for, um, for, for, for providing a, a maternity hospital uh, of, of the highest standards, uh, world, uh, worldwide standards, and that's what we want to ensure. I can't understand. But of course, there is, and has been said by other speakers, there is a hatred of the Catholic religion. There is a hatred of nuns and priests. And yes, some of them did wrong in the past. But an awful lot of them did an awful lot for, for young boys and girls and, and men and women around the, the, around the, the, the country. And, and they have to be appreciated for that. Yeah, don't know who. Thank you. The National Maternity Services in Ireland have fallen short when it comes to caring for women of this country and the future children that will be born here. I know of many HICWA reports of our maternity hospitals are outdated and it shows how, how bad the infrastructure is. I do wonder, is there another agenda here? Why would somebody go against this project? My duty of care 
is for the mothers, the generations of children to come. It is important to point out that the sisters are giving away the land worth £50 million on a 299-year contract. There are buildings that the government have, there are schools around this country that have 99-year leases which are, are there at the moment, and there doesn't seem to be a problem about that. This is 299 years. We are here to live for today, to look after the women of tomorrow and the children of tomorrow and today. That's what we're here to do. 299 years of a lease. Let's get this done. Let's look after the vulnerable. Let's look after the people that want to, to make this thing happen. Why is this, everything has to go backwards and try and get uh, media attention? When you're asked in on a door, what are you doing? I'm here to protect the people of today. I'm here to represent the people of today. And I'm here to care for. We're here to care for the women and children of this country and the husbands and the partners of this country. So let's stop the nonsense. Let's just get this thing going and let's move forward and care for the people of today. Thank you. As well. And when we see the waiting lists across every walk of society, we're 12 months waiting on gynecological services, and, and waiting lists have increased by 67% since March 2015. And when we see this Ferrari over this side, and we see the whole weight has exploded and mushroomed up, and they're not a mention of the children's hospital. Tarshi Kailta, in, in, in a, a major hole somewhere, not even being talked about now, it's off the radar, off the Richter scale, three times the price in a wrong site first day. We have a site gifted here by the Good Sisters of Charity, uh, a 299 year lease, so people want it, and it's referred to the Sinn Féin of 100 properties, I didn't know you that much property, but why don't you give away some of your free sites? I've often been negotiated uh, leases with schools and with boards of management and different organisations, GA clubs, and it's wonderful to get a lease of 30 years, 50 and uh, maybe, and uh, it's wonderful to get one in 99, but to get one of 299 was never heard of. Can I say that there, are, uh, there was uh, heinous crimes committed by some members of the, of the clergy, both male and female? But the good that they've done all over the world is costing uh, five and a half billion now for our NGOs to go around the world. That none did it for free. They brought water, education, food, healthcare all over the world. They had a massive reputation in this country in the 19th and 20th century for delivering healthcare. And all we can do now is demonise them and badmouth them and wreck them and attack them. It's shameful because they have no voice to speak and they're quite people and they have uh, people of prayer and faith and good by and large and they do great work. I could name off ten of them that I worked with on board of managers and whatever. Dedicated solely to the good of their communities. They had no families of their own. They went away and one of them has actually been buried today in Monaghan from my own area who gave a lifetime of service in Africa. And that's what they did. And they went away from their families. And to be attacked under siege here every day, and even Saturday when they couldn't come in, he was at the gate attacking them. It's sacrilege, it's, it's, it's disgusting to be honest. And I want to say that we certainly will be calling a vote against this motion if we're on our own, so be it. But we're proud to stand on the record of the good work and reputations of the sisters of many, uh, many orders and the police and, and, and the ladies as well that helped out. So, look, uh, this project has to be delivered. Get it done, they're given the site and stop. It's all about abortion. It's not about, and it's all about deputy, abortion, not about services. It's about abortion. Front line and centre, that's what it's about. A phony debate, and that's what it's all about. Nothing else. Now we go to the independent group where Deputy well, Catherine Connolly is sharing our time with Deputy Joan Collins. The Cancun Berlin, I want to thank Sinn Féin once again for giving us the opportunity by table in this motion. And in relation to Deputy Healy Ray, I don't think I want to be God, but if I was arrogant enough to go down that road, I choose to be a goddess maybe and do it completely differently. In relation to this matter, I have to say words fail me in relation to the hypocrisy. And I'm on record, um, um, Minister Butler, for praising you for your hands-on approach. But on this uh, issue, I fundamentally disagree with you. And two weeks ago, this was paused ostensibly to give us a chance to reflect and to see what would emerge. And I've read all of the documents as best I could. 
and I am no expert and I struggled with them. And they have raised more questions than answers. And what really deeply disturbs me is the narrative that has come from the government with certain TDs that were on the health committee that played the man rather than the issue. And I stayed late on Thursday, not as late as I should have, but as long as I could. And I really witnessed a deplorable display of tackling the person as opposed to eliciting information. I am not here to tackle or to give out about nuns. I was educated by nuns. I'm not here to even talk about nuns. I'm here to talk about why we don't have a public hospital on a public site. And the pathetic response from the St Vincent's Healthcare Group that they need ownership to have an integrated service is nothing short of pathetic and unacceptable to me as a woman and a female TD. That the government would accept that is also unacceptable to me. So let's look at what we've gone around in a circle. Let's look at what Mr Menton said back in 17. James Menton on record on the 30th of May 2017, the day after the Religious Sisters of Charity announced their intention to depart the St Vincent Health Group. He said the move would only proceed on the basis of existing agreements that give ownership and control of the new hospital to the St Vincent's Healthcare Group. Ownership and control, clearly stated. Fast forward to 22, that's exactly what we're giving to a trinity of control. Little things have changed. Changes with directorship in terms of numbers. De changes in terms of a golden share. And nowhere is it outlined the process of that golden share. But what we have, Minister, and I'm addressing you in particular because you have strong opinions on this. And I'm asking you to look at that trinity of ownership. St Vincent Holdings at the top of the pyramid. The government have absolutely no say, no influence, nothing. St Vincent's Holdings owned 100% St Vincent's Healthcare Group. No input from the government whatsoever, except perhaps through a director that will come up from the uh, uh, new company which was established just over less than two years ago, the designated company that will run the hospital. And that will be composed of nine directors, three of which will come from the St Vincent Healthcare Group. Can you tell me why they have to be there? Can you tell me why three directors from the owning group have to be on the hospital. Can you tell me that? Can you tell me why the director has to come from that group every three years? Can you tell me why no documentation or clarification, only once again assurances in relation to the transfer, not a gifting, a transfer of the land or this asset owned by the nuns to the new company St Vincent's Holding? Why can't we have that documentation? Were there any conditions? If not, wonderful. That means they can hand the land now to the state. So when I hear this sort of disingenuous argument going around that we're against the nuns or against the religion, may well be, but that's not the issue at all. The issue in the 21st century is a public maternity hospital on a public site. Why? Because that's what the doll wants. That's what they said in Slaunchik here. That's what the two reports said in relation to how we move away from private care and public facilities. Dr. Butler and Kat Catherine Day. Both reports ignored by the government. Not even mentioned by the government. I would think you might do us the decency of going through these issues with us and, and telling us what your opinion is on that. And then the deeply hypocritical stance to go with this motion after making the decision this morning in Cabinet not even to wait for democracy in action or the illusion of democracy in action. And as a woman, I won't accept this. I can't change your mind, but I can place on record that we saw through your spin particularly Mr Donnelly's spin, because that's all it is. It is absolute spin. I see through it. I'm telling the people that are listening that they see through it, and I share that with them, and it's unacceptable. Um, I'd like to thank Sinn Féin for putting this uh, private member's motion on the record tonight, and I absolutely support it, um, and I agree with what it has to say. But unfortunately, it is relevant, and it's irrelevant like our three other motions that we put here into the Dáil Chamber um, by the so so uh, Social Democrats, 
Deputy uh, Catherine Connolly and myself on the issue, and they were all not opposed by government. And this is a tactic increasingly being used by the government to demonstrate their complete disregard for supposedly democratic procedures in the chamber. The pause by the government in rubber stamping the deal with St Vincent's Holdings and St Vincent Healthcare Group for two weeks to supposedly allow for scrutiny of the arrangement by the Health Committee was nothing of the sort. You just needed a bit more time to get your ducks in a row. Um, Deputy Nessa Horrigan is to be congratulated for maintaining her principal position, um, but obviously the Deputy won't have an opportunity to uh, vote on this uh, bill, uh, motion tonight, and I think herself and obviously other members of the Green Party who had a very strong position on this um, are going to have to decide what their place is in their party. Um, as for the rest of the government and the party supporting it, you're a disgrace. Yet again, you've put, uh, uh, you have bent the knee to the powerful vested interests which have dem dominated the state since its inception and made the lives of women and very often their children an absolute misery. This was a test between the state and the Catholic Church and their proxies, a test you have failed miserably. Uh, you are covering up for your actions by claiming you are acting in the interests of women's health by getting the hospital built as soon as possible. And of course, this is a much needed modern facility. But the parties who have been in government since 2013, when St Vincent's Healthcare Group uh, arrogantly, arrogantly dismissed the uh, idea of co-location, it was then it was then that the process for compulsory purchase order should have been put in motion. If that had been done, the hospital would now be built, operational on state-owned land, fully publicly owned and run. We need to deal with the reality regarding the issues around the provision of abortion service in this country. Despite repeal of the Eighth Amendment and the introduction of legislation following it, abortion services are not, by any strength of the imagination, widely available. Half the 19 maternity hospitals, hospitals do not provide termination, eight of them state owned public hospitals. Nine out of ten GPs do not provide such services either. And re in relation to the issue of fatal fetal abnormality, it is, re it is required for two doctors to agree on a diagnosis, and there, and, and there are instances where in one healthcare setting termination is refused and then agreed at a different hospital. This is, not, this is what clinically appropriate can mean. Salvita Halapanavar was given uh, what her clinical clinician considered clinically appropriate care. She was not given the appropriate care which would have saved her life. The Catholic Church casts a long shadow and it seems to be particularly so in the medical professions. Leaving aside the question of, of Catholic ethos, ethos, a hospital costing up to and probably above one billion to build and then funded on a day-to-day -day basis by the state would effectively be, in par, uh, part, be part of the St Vincent's Healthcare Group, a private entity, even if it is a secular entity, which I don't believe for one minute, why is the state handing over effective control with questions over actual ownership to a private company? Why is the state prepared to enter a legal agreement with a private company? S. S. St Vincent's Holdings deliberately set up true offshore arrangements to avoid scrutiny of its real nature and the understandings of which it was set up. Uh, this, 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 point, this points to yet, another, to yet another miserable failure in relation to Toronto Care, the objective of a public national health care system open to all regardless of ability to pay. You have bent your knee, not just to the Vatican ambitions, but to the vested interests of private medicine. Um, Toronto Care has, hasn't a hope of ever been implemented or seen the light of day. And I really believe that this government is wrong. Um, I hope I am wrong, because I hope we never see into the future what we've seen in the past. Um, and uh, I, I, I really, I, I'm just very, very, very angry. Collins, now we go to uh, government response. Minister Frank Fian, Sh are you sharing with your colleague? Mark, I believe he has two minutes. Thank you very much, John Corda. Um, I think it's important, um, as someone who comes from a legal background, having spent over 25 years dealing with leasehold and freehold title, I'm very much aware of a 299-year lease. And it's interesting that only, um, you know, we, we had only one person in uh, to the Health Committee uh, who gave evidence on behalf of the people of the opponents of this project, and he admitted that he wasn't a property law expert. We had three different uh, companies and law firms in um, who clearly set out that this was good title which was being handed over and this is a lease 
from the St. Vincent's Hospital Holdings Group to the HSE. HSE are then giving a licence to the um, to the NMH, to the National Maternity Hospital, and that new group that's set up. And it's quite clear that leasehold title is accepted as good title in this country. And you take, for instance, our good friends across the house, Sinn Féin, all of their properties. Are they telling us that all the properties that they own are freehold title? They have leasehold title. A lot of the properties have leasehold title. And are you telling me the landlord is telling you what you can or cannot do? No, I don't think so. This is good title and this has been clear evidence given to the Health Committee that there is the state owns this property. No other interest can mortgage or do anything with the property without the consent of the HSE who are getting the lease. And I think it's extremely important. And it's also interesting, Stephen Dodd, senior counsel, who's quoted extensively, in page 62 of his opinion, he accepts that if you use say, the 1947 Health Act to compulsory acquire the land, you will not, the, the state would not succeed because it is clear that we're getting good title in the lease that is being offered here of 299 years. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the deputies for tabling this motion today, and I fully appreciate the importance of the issue and not the insignificant concerns that have been raised by many over the last few weeks and months. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to address some of those concerns here today. As Minister Donnelly alluded to in his speech, we are all trying to achieve the same goal. That goal is best described by the vision of the National Maternity Strategy that women and babies have access to safe, high-quality care in a setting that is most appropriate to their needs, that women and families are placed at the centre of all services and are treated with dignity, respect and compassion, and that parents are supported before, during and after pregnancy to allow them to give their child the best possible start in life. A significant part of delivering on that vision and of achieving our shared goal is to provide targeted investment in women's health services. This government has prioritised women's health comprehensively and has invested so heavily to ensure women and girls get the quality health care they expect and deserve. Another significant element of delivering on our shared vision is the development of a world-class maternity hospital that provides and performs for the women, families and babies of this country. In the context of our history with regard to women's health care, I of course appreciate the very valid concerns have been raised and I understand fully how sensitive the issue is. However, it is vital to point out that those very same concerns were identified at a very early stage and have been the basis of significant and protracted negotiations over several years. In particular, the issues of governance and clinical independence have been central to those discussions, and it is no surprise that people would find it difficult to trust assurances given about the services in the new hospital because they have been let down so badly in the past and reproductive rights have been so hard won. That is why so much time and effort has gone into developing the draft legal framework, so that we have legally binding commitments from all sides. This is what provides the assurances, not easy words, but agreed legal documents drafted with the support of legal advisers and exhaustively examined. That is how we can have confidence in the new hospital's ability to provide the full range of women's health services in accordance with the laws and policies of the state. The legal documents have all been published and there has been intense scrutiny. The absence of any religious ethos is crystal clear. The new hospital is obliged, not just allowed, to provide all lawfully permissible maternity, gynaecological, obstetrical and neonatal services and there are mechanisms to intervene in the likely event that there is an issue. The Minister of Health of the day can, if needed, 
direct the board of this new hospital to provide all these services. All lawful permissible services will be provided and nothing will be prohibited due to religious beliefs or ethical codes. What is very important and something I would like to remind the House is that the current infrastructure of the NMH does not provide an appropriate environment for the realisation of the National Maternity Strategy vision. Several hundred pregnant women require transfer to St Vincent's Hospital as inpatients, and a small number of critically ill women are transferred to receive intensive care not available on site at Hollis Street. This is not in keeping with the best practice, and the hospital also has many multi-occupancy wards, increasing the risk of infection and compromising the privacy and dignity of patients. By, by comparison, in the new NMH, all inpatient accommodation, including in the neonatal intensive care unit, will be in single rooms, increasing safety, privacy and dignity. The new hospital will also facilitate a modern campus approach to healthcare, where a range of medical entities operate in close pr proximity to improved patient care, patients' outcomes and patients' experience. It should be noted that clinicians at the National Maternity Hospital and beyond have publicly and very strongly expressed their support for the move. These are the people on the front line delivering babies and caring for women every day of the week. And it is certainly noteworthy that in a letter to senior ministers, 52 clinicians at the National Maternity Hospital outlined a strong need for this new hospital. The Director of Midwifery at the NMH, along with all the Assistant Directors of Midwifery, wrote recently to confirm their full support and re-emphasise the need for this key project. The Chair of the National Directors of Midwifery Forum also wrote on behalf of the Forum to support the move to the campus at St Vincent's Hospital, Elm Park. And the Chair of the Medical Board in Vincent's University Hospital wrote on behalf of the Medical Board, which represents over 250 clinicians across the Vincent's Hospital network, to outline their overwhelming support for the relocation project. These are the dedicated professionals who will be providing services in the new National Maternity Hospital. They understand how important and necessary this new facility is. And it is very clear that they have full confidence in the agreements that have been brokered. To conclude, the very bottom line, Kinkorla, is that the new National Maternity Hospital is so badly needed and further delay will only serve to increase that need. We know that the hospital must and will provide the full spectrum of services without any undue influence. We know that the state's investment is very well protected as a result of the lengthy negotiations that have carried on now for over several years. And we know that the project has the overwhelming support of the clinicians, midwives and management that will provide care in the new hospital. In Corla's time to get this hospital built so we can deliver on the vision of the National Maternity Strategy sooner rather than later. Mr Fian and Deputy Burke. We go then to the reply from Sinn Féin, starting with Deputy Paul Donnelly, followed by Deputy Kathleen Funchen, and then finally uh, Deputy David Cullinan. Good Ken uh, Everyone wants to see uh, the building of the new National Maternity Hospital. However, it's been overshadowed by the government's failure to listen to the many concerns of so many people inside this chamber and outside. The simple fact is the National Maternity Hospital built by the state must and should be built on land solely owned by the state. Long-term leasing is not the same as full ownership. And I think we have to nail the lie uh, that both Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael have had plenty of time over the years to build and provide a National Maternity Hospital on public lands. <clears throat> there are two main reasons why the ownership matters. 
Firstly, it avoids the complicated governance arrangements and any chance of limited services. And secondly, it safeguards the state's investment, avoids legal problems down the line, or if any big private company got involved in St Vincent's, which they could, uh, would see a health for profit opportunity. It would also give the government a bargaining chip because at present St Vincent's Healthcare Group holds all the cards. The control of the land is of the utmost importance and with the state's investment should come full ownership. I do not believe that everything has been done to acquire the site and I do not accept that there is not an option that involves state ownership of the land. In my opinion, the question of why the state cannot own the land has never been answered satisfactorily. Every effort should be made to acquire the land and the gifting of the, state to the, to the land to the state, which was already promised at the beginning of this, promise, at the beginning of this uh, process. The Taoiseach and the Tarnishta and the leader of the Greens have admitted having concerns about ownership. In government, Sinn Féin would insist and work with St Vincent's Hospital Group to persuade them to gift the land and work with them to ensure the site's integration and cohesion is protected and delivers the best outcome for all. Again, the government are shamefully engaging in the smoke and mirrors by not opposing this bill, only to stop members on their own benches, benches for voting in favour of this Sinn Féin motion. Gurumagat. Deputy Fudge. Um, thanks very much, Ken Carla. Firstly, I want to thank my own colleague, Deputy Colin Ann, for bringing this forward. Um, look, at the, this is the concluding of the debate. We, we know that there is very serious concerns, and they're not just concerns by uh, us in, in opposition, but there's concerns by so many women throughout the whole country. And unfortunately, it comes as a result of the history of you know, the treatment by, um, by the state of women. And you know, we all know we've had several discussions in this chamber on many issues in relation to women, but particularly in relation to women's health. And some of those are not as historic as others. The cervical check situation, cervical scandal, that wasn't that uh, far long in our history. Um, there was issues around uh, breast cancer screening. There's, there, the list is endless. And I actually wanted to take the opportunity because I think my colleagues have made the points that this does need to be a state-run hospital. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. But there are so many medical services for women that are just not adequate or that are absolutely not at the races. Um, but there's been discussions around menopause, and I think it really made it, made it had to go to the point where there was discussions on the national airwaves where people were ringing in to national programmes before you know, there's hardly been any sort of recognition of the amount of work that has to be done. And women literally left, like not being diagnosed as perimenopausal and all of the other things that come with that. I also want to mention endometriosis. That's a very serious condition that very many women suffer from. That is misdiagnosed, that is not treated, that is countless women have difficulties and issues, and it can seriously affect fertility and other issues later in your life if it's not addressed. And last year when we were sitting in the convention centre, I told the story of somebody who um, is very close to me who was misdiagnosed for years and actually was in the gown going down for a gallbladder operation at the age of 25 when luckily somebody had the, the cop on and the common sense to say, I wonder should we do a scan of the uterus as well. Up to that point, imagine that hadn't been done and it was uh, endometriosis and they were about to remove this person's gallbladder in the gown, ready, fasting from the night before. That's the type of service that women unfortunately have gotten used to and they shouldn't. It's unacceptable, it's disgraceful, and by not having a fully state-run and state-owned hospital, women are afraid that this kind of treatment is going to continue. And that's not to even get into the whole debate on repealing the Eighth Amendment um, that was successful in 2018 and the knock-on effect for that. I'm, I'm out of time, but I did just want to say that women have been failed so badly in this state. We have an opportunity to have a first-class hospital that we all want, that we all know is overdue, but it needs to be state-run and state-owned. Thank you, Ken Corley. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Cullinan. Thank you, and I want to thank all of the speakers uh, on all sides who uh, spoke in this debate. And I'll start with what, I, what I'll finish with what I started with uh, earlier today, which is I want to see a national maternity hospital, and I want it built as quickly as possible, and I want it in public ownership, and I want a public hospital. But it is absolutely breathtaking and amazing to see the lengths that this government will go to to sell what I see is a bad deal. This repeated assertion that black is white, 
that the state will own the land when clearly the freehold of the land will be retained and owned by St Vincent's Healthcare Group is quite amazing. And those who made that argument know exactly the point that has been made. The reason why a HSE hospital will not be built on that land is because St Vincent's Healthcare Group will retain the freehold and will retain ownership of the land. The reason why this new company, a National Maternity Hospital at Ellen Park, is being established is because St Vincent's Healthcare Group do not want a HSC hospital operating on their land, uh, co-locating with the public and the private hospital that's there. And that, for me, goes completely against the spirit of Schlant de Care. Uh, when they were asked what is their reason for uh, not gifting the land uh, to the state, they said they want an integrated model of uh, healthcare, all of the hospitals uh, co-located under the umbrella of the St Vincent's Healthcare uh, Group. Um, and the establishment of this company, uh, which uh, is now going to run and manage the hospital. And it, it's also quite breathtaking that the government took a decision today, the Cabinet signed off on this, uh, in the full knowledge that there was no real substantive talks with St Vincent's Healthcare Group over the last number of months. And if the chair of the St Vincent's Healthcare Group are to be believed over the last number of years, uh, there was no pressure brought to bear on St Vincent's Healthcare Group, either by the Minister for Health or the Taoiseach. There were certainly no high-level talks in relation to the ownership of the land. Instead, the white flag was raised and all of the excuses have been rolled out as to why St Vincent's Healthcare Group simply will not give the land to the state. And it is, I have to say, Ken Corla, deeply cynical that the government say that they will not oppose a motion as I've raised this with you in the past on several occasions, and then not implement what the motion calls for. We're being told that the rural independents will call a vote on this motion, which is their right. So if there is a vote on this motion, let's be very clear what people will be voting for. Let's be very clear what government representatives will be voting for. They'll be voting on the text of the motion. And the text of the motion commits the government to pursue the full realisation of the promise that was made by the Religious Sisters of Charity to give the land to the people of Ireland. The motion commits the government to engage at the highest level with the new ownership group behind St Vincent's Healthcare Group, St Vincent's Holdings CLG, to secure full public ownership of the site and new building, with all necessary safeguards, way leaves and guarantees to ensure the integrity, integration and highest quality of care on the site. That's what the government will be voting on tomorrow if there is a vote. So you cannot speak from two sides of your mouth on this one. Tomorrow you will have the opportunity to vote in favour of this motion. I hope that the government does. But if ministers and members of this government come in here tomorrow and vote in favour of this motion, which commits the government to do very clear and explicit things, that needs to be done. If it isn't done, that will be a deeply, deeply cynical move by the government. And I believe it will further heighten concerns that people have about this arrangement. And for those in government that came in again and, and made the point that this is ownership of the land, all of the concerns have now been addressed. There's nothing overly complex about this. And then you hear the minister, as he did today, try and explain the very difficult, complex legal contractual arrangements which are being put in place. The new company which has been formed will have its own constitution, it will have its own board. The di di directors will come from three different sources, as we know. It will be a subsidiary of St Vincent's Healthcare Group. They own the freehold and they will have a lease arrangement with the HSE and a licence arrangement. And that company is owned by uh, St Vincent's Holdings. So there is a huge amount of unnecessary complication around this. Why? Because they don't want to build a HSC hospital on that site. And that is the bottom line. And that's wrong. That's not the best way to build this new National Maternity Hospital. So you'll have your chance tomorrow, folks. And if you do vote for it, I can guarantee you that we will make sure to hold you to account that you deliver on what you vote for, if it is the case that you vote for uh, the motion. Uh, that concludes our debate on the private member's motion. And the question now is that the motion be agreed to. Not agreed. 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 Not agreed.
Stolium Gulen Kesh Richard Vota. Insofar as a vote has been requested, it is deferred until voting time tomorrow evening. Thanks to all of you for your participation therein.